Please take your Bibles and turn back to that portion of Scripture that we read just a moment ago. Exodus chapter 15, we're looking once again at verses 1 through 21, a magnificent and extended song in the Old Testament. It's also mentioned in the book of Revelation. It relates to national Israel. There's the song of Moses spoken of here in Exodus chapter 15 and also the song of Moses spoken of in Revelation chapter 15. We also find in Revelation 15 the song of the Lamb that relates to the church. So there's the song of Moses, the song of the Lamb, Israel and the church seen as distinct in the book of Revelation. And we've read that just a moment ago in verses 1 through 21 of Exodus. Now, last week, guest speaker Reverend Keith Coleman was here while I was down in um, at the ICCC Aladic meetings in Mexico and in a place that is almost totally unpronounceable. Although I understand that if we had had time to go on some little trips, that there are some uh, ancient uh, Aztec ruins down there, some of those temples and things, sort of on the um, Yucatan Peninsula. And as we came up, we our hotel was right on the waterfront. I said, is this the Pacific or the Atlantic Ocean? And somebody just chuckled and said, this is the Gulf of Mexico. <laughs> so we're on the south side of the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, Quats Quatzacolcos, I think, is the name of that place. But anyway, you try to pronounce it, I won't. <laughs> okay, so now we're over there in Exodus chapter 15. Thank you so much for all your prayers uh, on my behalf. I had one day, as you know, of Montezuma's revenge. And um, uh, the grace of God taught me what a weak human being indeed I am and how close we are to eternity. <laughs> so thank you for your prayers. All right, let's um, review very quickly because we haven't been in here for a couple of weeks now. Uh, what we've seen thus far is music plays a key role in the Bible, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. That's principally because God himself is a musical being, so of course we're going to be reflecting that in the things that he has created. Zephaniah 3.17 tells us that God sings. The Bible also tells us that the devil is a musical being, and both Isaiah and Ezekiel uh, explain that he actually has musical organs built into his spiritual body. And it talks about him being in the, the Garden of Eden in Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 13, and says, The workmanship of thy tabrets, that's a musical rhythmical instrument, and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. So we know that we're talking about Satan. He's a created being. He has musical instruments actually built into him. The first session we saw tabrets was a kind of tambourine or timbrel, uh, same type of thing that we discover that Miriam and the women are using uh, as they are singing the song that we find in Exodus 15. In the last session, we learned about the second musical instrument built into Satan, the word pipes, and that it's in the plural, it's not in the singular. We saw that that word is nekev, which is a bezel. The bezel is a sloping edge or face on a cutting tool like a chisel. It also refers to the oblique or face of a cut gem, specifically the upper, upper faceted portion of a brilliant, that's a special kind of cut, uh, projecting from the setting. The word nekev comes from the primary Hebrew word nakav, which means to puncture or perforate with violence. It's also a word that is used in various contexts where it's translated to blaspheme or to curse. And we see that all of those elements are in the character of Satan when we do a thorough study of scripture. God chose a word for the musical instrument that's built into him that expresses all of the devil's principal character elements. He's musical. He's like a sharp cutting instrument. He's the sum of created beauty that God made. His name Lucifer means light bearer. He punctures with violence. He's the original blasphemer and cursor. And so it is most appropriate that this specific word for pipes built into Satan should be used in this context. We also saw other words for pipes, that's flutes of the recorder type or of the uh, pan flute kind of uh, pipes in various contexts that demonstrate Hebrew musical and poetic parallelism, which is a, a very important topic. I, I don't think we'll get to it today, but that's something that we'll be talking about to understand what is biblical music. But to understand what Hebrew poetic parallelism is, will help us to more closely define what God says is appropriate music. Key to our discussion, we saw that the New Testament also refers to pipes as musical instruments. In 1 Corinthians 14, 7, and even things without life giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? Now, 
it's very important that we look at that context. And I'm not going to cover it in detail like I did before, but let me just summarize very quickly. That's in the context of a discussion about the gift of tongues. Just like the speaking gifts, including tongues, was given to articulate an understandable biblical message in the language of the listener even so that is the purpose of musical instruments to give an articulate understandable biblical message to the listener i hope you get that because that's the way paul uses it when talking about the speaking gifts in first corinthians chapters 12 and 14. god wants it to be a clear understandable message that's actually set out by the music itself not merely by the words which are attached to the music and i gave you the illustrations of uh, you know playing uh, reveille uh, you know uh, when it's time to go to bed bump da dum da dum da dum da dum da dum da dum da you know you don't do that or you don't play taps when you're about to go into to battle you know um, music has meaning in itself even when it doesn't have words you know that you feel that the world understands it and Christians refuse to admit it the world uses music to control people and Christians think it has no effect on them even without words music can be used to control people so as we said rock music with decibel ratings off the scales doesn't do this new age music that merely floats along with no structure fails to do it there must be as Paul says a distinction in the sounds Otherwise, who will prepare himself for the battle? Paul uses the words aulos and auleo, a flute that is blown. So let's review briefly the principles that we've outlined so far. First, God ordained musical instruments to be used in divine worship. Unlike the theology that says only unaccompanied choral music is permissible, in the Bible we see instruments representing all three basic elements of music, melody, harmony, and rhythm. And we saw those, for example, over in 1 Samuel 10, 1 through 13. Second, Music is seen in scripture as a vehicle for giving honor. In at least one case in 1 Samuel 18, it caused jealousy in the heart of another person, that is Saul, who thought he should have had the honor instead of David. So the honor that's given by the music can be for a man, which results in jealousy from another man, or the honor can be for God, which results in the jealousy, as in the case of Satan, who twists the music to give himself honor. Principle three was music is seen in the Bible as a means of spiritual and emotional healing, even when the suffering comes from an evil spirit. We saw that in at least one case, God sent an evil spirit as a judgment on Saul for rejecting the word of the Lord. That's in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 14. We also noticed that in that context that the right kind of music not only gave personal healing to Saul, but it also drove away the demonic spirits and that the wrong kind of music attracts demonic spirits. In the context of demonically induced suffering, we also saw that Satan can cause suffering for two different reasons. Number one, either as an instrument for growth, as we saw in the case of Job, or two, as an instrument of chastening, as in the case of Saul. We also saw that it's true that music in and of itself is not the ultimate panacea for all spiritual and emotional healing, but only one of many vehicles that God can and often does use, but not always. Fourth, Having the right kind of instrument does not therefore make the music right. The question is, what is the purpose for which the music is being used? Israel was using all the correct instruments, but they still went into captivity. And Isaiah makes a point out of that in Isaiah chapter 5, verses 11 through 16. In other words, just having music played by a symphony orchestra does not make the music right, or playing it on a guitar does not make it wrong. So let me emphasize my point again. I've said this three weeks. I'll probably say it many more times before I die or before you die. If we still are with each other at some point, you'll hear me say it. Some of you work in places where the company plays mind-numbing pagan music with pagan words and pagan philosophies belching out all day long. You think you're tuning it out. You are not tuning it out. It reaches your subconscious. It is making a subliminal impact on you and it is affecting your body, that is your health. It is affecting your soul, that is your emotions. It is affecting your spirit, that is your philosophy of life and your world view. And by listening to that music, you are opening yourself up to pagan thoughts that gently drag you into decadence and wake you up one morning asking yourself how you got there. If you listen to it too long, it'll do permanent damage. 
just like listening to any music at mega decibels will damage your hearing, no matter whether it's good music or bad music. People, there are many talented musicians in the pagan world, very skilled. The devil doesn't just pick up the junk. He tries to get the very, very best and then twist it for his own glory and for the destruction of other people. Satan's not stupid. He's the most brilliant creature that God ever made. And he knows how to manipulate what God built into him, which was supposed to be for God's glory, and Satan has used it for his own glory. A talented musician, whether a great violinist or a rock star, can with great clarity express his worldview or the worldview of the composer who wrote the music. On the other hand, somebody with a wrong worldview who performs music written by a composer with a right worldview can faithfully communicate the truth musically, just like a gifted pagan can read the Bible aloud with expressive power. There are unsaved pagans who can read the Bible aloud much more expressively than I can, although I do my very best when I read scripture to make it come alive. I try not to say God so loved the world that he gave his own that's sin to read scripture like that read it with meaning there are gifted pagans who can read it with meaning just like there are gifted Christians who can play wicked music and express a world view which does not represent Christ on the other hand somebody with a wrong world view performs music written by a composer with a right world view can communicate the truth musically what the church at large has failed to understand is that with a Christian, with a Christian worldview who performs so-called Christian music that imitates the world, music which is specifically designed to communicate a pagan worldview is not in fact performing Christian music. Instead, he or she is confusing other Christians who say, but he's a Christian artist, it must be okay. That's stupidity, folks. It's foolishly dragging other Christians into a mindset that is open to receiving pagan philosophy. And we talked about crossover music under certain Christian recording labels. They understand that. And they understand that they take nightclub music and just put it in a Christian context and dress the guy up like a Christian uh, that everybody will think it's talking about Jesus when in fact, if it was performed in a nightclub, they'd think it's talking about some man making love to a woman. My summary of point four. Having the right kind of instruments does not therefore make the music right. The question is, for what legitimate purpose is the music being used? And can this particular music be used to honestly promote that legitimate purpose? You remember my illustration, you can't use a strip tease show to present the gospel to lecherous porn users. Is the question is, is this use of a legitimate means for a legitimate purpose? The end does not justify the means, the means and the purpose must both be legitimate. Fifth, the absence of music, and this is where we closed, the absence of music that glorifies God is a sign of judgment and desolation. And so before discussing principle five two weeks ago, I tried to explain what I'm doing with the series because everybody's not gonna be at the same level at the same time. Just like a little kid can say, I know how to play the piano. And he sits down and he plays Mary Had a Little Lamb and Chopsticks. Does he play the piano? Yes, he might play Mary Had a Little Lamb perfectly does that make him a great musician? No. Or a, a man who has a PhD in music can say, I can compose and play music and he may be a gifted pianist and he can play magnificently. Does he play the piano? Yes. A little kid plays the piano too. But they're not at the same level. So as we go through this series, all of us start out at different levels. I hope that you will move to higher levels. We will not all be on the same level by the time we get to the end of the series, but I hope you learn the principles that enable you to discern what is right music and what is wrong music according to the Word of God. So I got these text messages that I told you about. Question one was a text message that said, so is Mozart not someone we should listen to? As I read about him, there's nothing that says he wrote to share his faith. Be glad he didn't. He was Roman Catholic. Just trying to look into what you spoke about this morning. I love music, but I want to be honoring God with what I listen to, so I am trying to do some of my own research. Answer. Here's the answer I sent back on text. I'm trying to teach biblical principles of musical discernment and let the Holy Spirit bring conviction to each person and give direction about specific composers and pieces. I am less concerned about most of the classical composers than I am about 
contemporary Christian music because that's where the problem is in the church today. Most of the classical composers followed biblical principles, even the Roman Catholic composers. But you know, I gave you an illustration about a classical composer, and I think only two people in the room, maybe one and a half, because there was sort of a hesitant hand, went up when I talked about Richard Wagner, which looks like Richard Wagner in English, uh, and nobody ever heard of him. I thought, well, I am starting at ground zero here. <laughs> uh, the problem is not classical music. You know, I mean, you can worry about that, but the, where the problem in the church today is with CCM. That's where we have our problem. That's why I'm hoping that you can at least apply these principles to the stuff that you're already listening to that you already know about. Then there was question two. Sorry, another question. So if the person is a strong Christian with the intent to only honor God, then the music is okay to listen to, correct? Or is there more to it that I'm missing? Answer. That's the point that I'll be covering next week, which I didn't get all the way through that particular week. There are sincere Christians who are ignorant, but that sincerity does not make their ignorance okay. So your intent is not what is just necessary. It can be your intent to walk from here to Rome and walk across the ocean, but your intent won't work. Just having a good intent. You know, my mother used to have a saying. She said, uh, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And uh, that's really true in music, too. Uh, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. It's not merely a matter of our intent. We have to have specific concrete facts. It can be your intent to go to uh, Los Angeles, California, but if you take the wrong road, you're going to end up in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. You have to have not just the correct intent. You have to have the specific road, the specific principles, to be able to head down the right road and get to the right destination. And different ones of us are along different places along that road. I'm hoping that we'll all learn the principles by which to go down the road. Therefore, the absence of music. So this was back to where we're starting with point number four. The absence of music that glorifies God is a sign of judgment and desolation. The absence of music that glorifies God is a sign of judgment and desolation. Folks, we are living in a time where more and more there is becoming an absence of music that glorifies God. That is one of the signs that God gives to a country that he is bringing judgment and desolation upon the country. The absence of music that glorifies God. Isaiah chapter 24 makes that very clear. Uh, beginning in verse 1, Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty and maketh it waste. He turneth it upside down and scattereth it abroad the inhabitants thereof. So we've got the signs of judgment here. And it shall be as with the people, so with the priests, as with the servants, so is the master. No, it's right across the board. As with the maid, so with her mistress. As with the buyer, so with the seller. As with the lender, so with the borrower. As with the taker of usury, so with the giver of usury. The land shall be utterly emptied, utterly spoiled, for the Lord has spoken his word. Well, what are some of the signs of that? He tells you about it. Therefore, at the curse devour the earth, they that dwell there are desolate, the inhabitants of the earth are burned, few men left, new wine mourneth, vine languisheth, merry heartieth do sigh, the mirth of the tabrets ceaseth, the noise of them that rejoice, the joy of the harp ceaseth. It's the absence of music that glorifies God. Those are signs of the judgment that's coming. Judgment in the absence of godly music. Now, I hope to develop that theme a little bit more when we get into the book of Revelation and look at the music that fills the earth at that time in contrast to the music that's going on in heaven as expressed in the book of Revelation. I'll hold that till later. But I give you that one example out of Revelation chapter 18, verses 21 through 24. And a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone, cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down, and shall be found no more at all. And the voice of the harpers and musicians and of pipers and trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in thee. Absence of godly music is a sign of God's judgment and desolation. It's one of the principal themes of Psalm 137. Israel has gone into captivity by the waters of Babylon. We sat down, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst of They weren't singing around, you know, singing music on their harps. Because it says, for they that carried us away captive required of us a song. And they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? That was the context of judgment upon Israel and desolation. So point five, the absence of music that glorifies God is a sign of judgment and desolation. That brings us to point number six for today. 
Number six, the corollary truth to this is, now listen carefully, this is number six. You don't have this in your notes yet. Number six, the objective, not subjective, the objective purpose of music is to glorify God. Let me say it again. Point number six, the objective purpose of music is to glorify God. If in some way it does not glorify God and direct your thoughts to Him, you need to question whether or not it's right music. In other words, if it stimulates your flesh to carnal passion, it is not of God. Truly Christian music must glorify God. How do we know this? Because Paul says so. Paul exhorts, this is 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever ye do. Now that covers a rather broad spectrum. Whatsoever ye do. That means the stuff you sing, the stuff you listen to, the stuff you play, the instrument you play it on, the, the styles in which you play it. Whatsoever ye do, do all, not most, do all to the glory of God. Now this past week, I preached a couple of messages to the International Council of Christian Churches and to the Alliance of Latin American Churches in Mexico. And so uh, I have a lot to say on that subject of doing all to the glory of God because that was one of my uh, messages that I got assigned. But let me give you a couple of passages that define what we must do to glorify God. We saw that one in 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Now 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. For all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him amen, to the glory of God. Now look at the last two words. To the glory of God by us. All of God's promises are true and amen unto the glory of God by us. God gives us promises. He gives them to us to do what? Bring him glory. By us. How about 2 Corinthians 4.15? For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might, through the thanksgiving of many, redound to the glory of of God. Redound means to pile it up, to heap it up to the glory of God. It's through thanksgiving. Thanksgiving of believers gives glory to God, and so hymns of thanksgiving are particularly appropriate. Not just hymns where we're asking him for stuff, but hymns of thanksgiving. Do you remember what Paul says was absent in the lives of the pagans and why God turned them over to all the reprobate actions that you find at the end of Romans chapter 1 from verses 18 to the end of the chapter. Two things why he turned them over to stuff that ended up in sodomy. Two things. When they knew God, they glorified him not as God. That was number one. Number two was neither were they thankful giving glory to God deals with his person. You glorify him for who he is. Thanksgiving to God deals with his work. You are thanking him for what he's done. And the pagans refuse to glorify who he is and to thank him for what he's done. So the music that we should be performing and listening to and participating in should give glory to God for who he is, and express our thanksgiving to him for what he has done. All the great hymns of the faith do that. That's why some of them have lasted hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, and stuff that was composed back in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, especially in the 60s, has disappeared into the dust. The so-called Christian music. As one guy has put it, uh, you know, those are 7-Eleven songs, seven words sung 11 times. Uh, you know, that's the kind of stuff that will not last forever, folks. To the glory of God. Well, anyway, truly Christian music must glorify God. Um, Ephesians 3.21. Here again, it tells us the focus. Unto him be glory in the church. We as believers are supposed to be bringing him glory in the church it says, by Jesus Christ throughout all ages, world without end, amen. What are we going to be doing through all of eternity? Why don't you start doing it now? That's Paul's point in Ephesians 3.21. Unto him be glory in the church. 
You know, all of creation will ultimately fulfill this purpose of giving glory to God through music. We read that over in Revelation chapter 4, verses 8 and following. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him. And they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Focus on who God is, his holiness, his character, his awesome power is eternality from eternity past through time present to eternity future. That is the song of the seraphim that surround the throne. We'll be coming, or comparing that rather, to Isaiah 6. Revelation 4.8 is quoting Isaiah 6. And according to John 12, 38 through 41, the angels in Isaiah 6 are singing that to Jesus. We'll talk about that later. Verse 9, And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, glory, honor, thanks. What's one of the things we learned about music which Saul got jealous over David about? It was the music was giving honor to David and Saul got jealous. And the music that gives honor to God, Satan is jealous. Here's music that gives glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who lives forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created. There's the creator God in the book of Revelation. Who is the creator God? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And who's it talking about? Jesus, verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld what? His glory! His glory! The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth do all to the glory of God give him glory as creator don't take it away from him by some kind of stupid pagan theistic evolution threshold theories and all the other garbage that floats through so called evangelical churches today we serve the living creator who spoke a word and it was so Verse 8, And when he had taken the book, the four and twenty uh, elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. Verse 9, And they sung a new song. You see, there's music in heaven. What do you think it's going to be? Some of this drivel and tripe that these so-called Christian artists wiggle on the stage to rock music and strobe lights, half naked, and some of them on drugs, that is not going to be in heaven. They sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Those are songs of redemption. Are you getting the idea of the kind of music that is sung to the glory of God in Scripture? I hope you're picking that up. And has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts, and the elders. This gigantic chorus, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. You know, Handel set that music, set that, those words to music. Worthy is the Lamb. I love that chorus. Because worthy is the Lamb. It's all about Jesus, not about you and what you like. Do you get it? 
It's all about Jesus. That's music that glorifies God. And every creature which is in heaven, every one of them, and on earth, and under the earth, and such as are in the sea, and all that in them are heard, I say, blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. Does the music you sing drive you to your knees? Does it drive you to worship? Biblical worship, not Baal worship. Let me give you just one more passage on the general purpose of music to glorify God. Romans chapter 11, verse 36. For of him, that's Jesus Christ, and to him, that's Jesus Christ, are all things to whom be glory forever Amen. Does it glorify Christ? Because all of creation, even the pagans, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of the glory of God the Father. It will take less pressure, of course, to make some poor drunken alcoholic bend the knee to Jesus than it will take to make Satan bend the knee, but someday Satan himself will bend the knee and all of his demonic hosts. Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Okay, even pagans will ultimately fulfill the purpose of bowing before his glory and none of the Baal worship music will be in heaven. Romans 15, 9, and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, for this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles and, last four words, sing unto thy name. Even the Gentiles will have to do it. The Goyim Matthew 24, 30. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with great power and glory. You see, God's going to get the glory one way or the other. Chapter 25, 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. Do you get it? The purpose of man is to bring glory to God not to feel good about himself. Totally different than the Joel Osteen kind of theology. The feel-good theology. That is not your purpose in life, to feel good about yourself. Your purpose in life is to glorify God. Okay, so how does this requirement of doing all for the glory of God specifically apply to music? we got six minutes. The glory of God is one of the grandest themes of scripture. The term glory appears over 400 times in the King James Version of the Bible. Sometimes it refers to men such as Pharaoh and his proud boasting, but the predominant use of the term speaks of God. Men usurp the glory of God with their puny arrogance, but when God shows forth his glory, especially the glory of the Shekinah that we've talked about, the earth will wilt and burn. So what does it mean? Soli Deo Gloria, glory to God alone. Now, some of you guys out here have been reciting the Westminster Catechism for years and years and years. Have you paid attention to the words that drone out of your lips? Did you know the Westminster Catechism talks about the glory of God? How many of you can tell me which article in the Westminster Catechism talks about the glory of God? Anybody? Okay, which, which number is that? Number one, in fact, not only number one, but number one and number two. The first two questions of the Westminster Catechism focus on the glory of God. Why didn't all of you know that? I mean, it's not like it's buried someplace down around 97 or something. It's the very first two. The very first two in the Westminster Catechism. Number one question, what is the chief end of man? Answer number one, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. 
folks, the people who wrote the Westminster Catechism, they understood this principle. The chief end of man, not one of the many ends of man, not one of the options that man has, the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Not to enjoy yourself, not to run things according to your own time schedule and according to your own, you know, whatever it is that you happen to want, pizza, for example. Question number two was what rule hath God given to direct us how we may glorify and enjoy him? If that's our chief end, so how do we know how to do it? The answer is the word of God, which is contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments, is the only rule to direct us how we may enjoy, uh, glorify and enjoy him. Folks, live your theology. Don't just talk about it. Don't just drone through it and then forget what you said. Indeed, not only man, but all of creation was made by our Creator to bring Him praise, honor, and glory, and someday God has prophetically guaranteed that it will. In that heart-pounding, knee-rattling, awe-inspiring throne room vision in Revelation 4, Christ appears on the throne of his glory and we hear the voice of the 24 elders roaring out a paean of praise. The four and 20 elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worshiped him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created. What a magnificent scene to open the heavenly courts of eternity. How well it portrays the glory of God. And what an introduction for the text that we started with. Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. That includes your music. Whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. It's a brief text, but it is filled with intense obligation. This is not an option, folks. This is an obligation that affects every area of lives, including our music. It affects the ordinary things of life, like eating and drinking, which are mentioned in the text. It affects the extraordinary things, even the heroic things that God sometimes calls us to do. It affects the hard things and the easy things. It's a challenge to courage and stamina. It's a call to rely on divine strength and guidance. It's a command to put ourselves second and God first. That means putting music that glorifies God first and pu music that putting music that satisfies our flesh second. It's an obligation to develop the divine order of priorities. That leads to two basic questions. What areas of life does the command cover? And two, what interpersonal relationships are affected when we do all to the glory of God? Whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. That affects scheduled activities and unscheduled crisis times in life. It affects our chosen actions, our reactions when we're taken by surprise. It causes us to assess the temporal nature of life. It gives us focus to make the most beneficial choices and to always choose the best over the good. It affects all the conscious choices that we make in life and habits that we specifically and knowingly develop. It affects our involuntary and unconscious habits. It challenges us to sit up and reevaluate our purposes and our goals. It sometimes causes us to change our life direction. It sometimes directs us to enter into a different door than the one we thought we should take. It demands that we eliminate the unnecessary and trivial things in life. It causes us to focus on the things of heaven rather than the things of earth. It causes us to look both through the telescope of the future and the microscope of our present life. It causes us to act on the basis of eternity where things last forever rather than on the basis of time where it all passes away. Whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. That indeed challenges us to assess our time and its use. It confines and at the same time it expands what we can legitimately do with fleeting minutes and resources that God has entrusted to our care. It determines the nature and timing of our relationships. It determines the depth of our relationships. It determines the length of our relationships and whether we should bring a relationship to a close no matter how painful. It may cause us to deepen a relationship if it will make us more effective in glorifying God. It determines the specific group of people that we choose to develop into friends. It determines our choice of a life partner and the timing of entering into marriage. 
whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. That's a command that determines what we provide for our families, what we allow them to do, the choices we make for those under our authority. It engages us in our education, our occupations, our hobbies, our free time, our activities, our entertainment, our responsibilities. It determines what we do in public and what we do in secret. It determines the legitimate and illegitimate exercise of our authority. It teaches us submission to a higher authority. It teaches us when, where, how, and what, and to whom to give, and from whom to withhold our giving. Whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. That's a command that teaches us to act like Jesus, to study him so that we know how to move in a sinful world without being polluted by it. It teaches us to seek wisdom, which is the principal thing. It teaches us to read and study the scripture. It requires us to learn the specific facts of scripture that we might understand God and his will for our lives better. It teaches us to learn the Bible's commands and prohibitions, its principles and its priorities, so that we can maximize the glory of God in our interactions with the world around us. It teaches us to pray. It teaches us how to pray, how to persevere in prayer, the request to make and the request not to make when to pray, for whom to pray, and for whom not to pray. Because the Bible gives you specific illustrations of people for whom you are not to pray. Whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. It teaches us how to interact with other people, both with the lost and with brothers and sisters in Christ. Doing all for the glory of God teaches us how to stand against apostasy. It teaches us to be compassionate. How to be compassionate? To whom to be compassionate? It teaches us how to fight the spiritual warfare. It teaches us to be valiant. It teaches us to live or die for Christ, but never to compromise. It teaches us to be unashamed of the gospel of Christ. It teaches us to witness. It teaches us to be courageous enough to confront a sinning brother in love and humility. It teaches us the meaning of sacrifice. It teaches us to die to self. Oh boy, that's a big one in music. It teaches us to die to self. It teaches us to earnestly seek the will of God. It teaches us to put the will of God before our own will. It teaches us to defer to others and to exercise Christian charity. Oh my, I have so much more to say. And we're already five minutes past time. Whatsoever you do, whatsoever you do, that includes your music. Do all, do all, that includes your music to the glory of God. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. It's a magnificent word. It's an eternal word. It's a word forever settled in heaven. And in the end, it all boils down to whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Father, we pray that you'll take your word and use it in our hearts to the glory of God to the exaltation of our Savior, Jesus Christ, God come in the flesh, the one who is our Redeemer, our Creator, the one who sustains us day by day, the one to whom we shall someday give an account for all judgment is committed under the Son. Do all to the glory of God. What are those secret sins? What are those things that we hide from the other Christians? What are the things that nobody else knows about? What are the things that we put on a good face and we pretend that we're Christians, but we're not doing it for the glory of God. We're doing it to satisfy the lusts of the flesh. We say we can't overcome it. Yes, we can by the Spirit of God who dwells in us. Do all to the glory of God. Thank you for your word, Father, in Jesus' name. Apply it to our hearts. Amen.